I'm Jacob Mann from Technical University in Denmark and uh, uh, welcome back from a summer break to this uh, series of uh, European American uh, collaboration seminars in wind energy and uh, Sue Ellen and I are organizing these seminar series and Sue Ellen will introduce uh, today's speaker. And today we're uh, thrilled to have Pat Moriarty of the National Renewable Energy Lab, where he leads the Wind Energy Systems Group. He's been at NREL since 2001. His research ex expertise includes wind farm atmosphere interactions, wind turbine design, and aerodynamics and aeroacoustics of wind turbines. Currently, Pat leads the DOE American Wake Experiment, Awaken, which he's going to talk about today. And that's a uh, an observational campaign to examine wind farm atmospheric interactions across scales. He's published lots of papers related to wind energy and is an associate editor for wind energy. So Pat, uh, love to have you share your screen and talk about Awaken. Okay, thanks, Sue. And how's that look? Looks great. That looks great. <laughs> okay, all right. Thanks for having me. So yeah, today I'll talk, I'll just give a, a pretty broad overview of the American Wake Experiment or Awaken. Um, for those of you who've been closely following Awaken, a lot of this material uh, will seem familiar, um, but hopefully I'll have a couple interesting things, um, some some relatively new results that I can share, um, well, at least towards the end of the presentation. <clears throat> but I'll start off with, with an overview and, and maybe some motivation. So uh, American Wake Experiment, one of the big things that we're interested in, of course, is our wakes. Um, so when turbines interact with each other uh, within a typical wind farm, you'll see something like 10% of the overall energy is lost due to wakes. Um, this is just relative to if, if turbines didn't interact at all or if they were standalone. What's perhaps even more interesting is the uncertainty of the models that are used to predict the energy production of wind farms. And here, the uncertainty or the variability of those predictions is still, to this day, uh, fairly high. Um, so up to 20 to 50% of that 10% energy loss. Um, and so what that means is something like uh, 2 to 5% of the energy production, uh, plus or minus, is the uncertainty in that prediction. And just to give you an idea of, of how big that is, and uh, a typical profit margin for a wind farm is often 3%. Um, so really the uncertainty is, is plus or minus uh, the profit margin for the wind farm owner. So um, we really wanna understand what's going on physically uh, for wakes and other wind farm atmospheric interactions in order to reduce that uncertainty. Uh, we probably won't uh, eliminate it entirely as we won't eliminate wake losses, but um, Really, that's that's the big motivation for the Awaken project to get observations that we can then use to reduce the uncertainty of models. So these uh, um, uh, predictions or uncertainties have uh, financial implications. So uh, way back in 2019, when we were just getting started with the Awaken project, um, Orsted had the, had this. Uh, uh, at the time was somewhat of a, a groundbreaking announcement in that for their entire fleet, they had to readjust their energy estimates. So they had overestimated the amount of energy production by about 2%. They had a big press release. This actually resulted in a loss of, um, an immediate loss of, of their stock price. Um, although after this, it recovered quite well and, um, Actually, there have been some more recent announcements that have <laughs> reduced this further, uh, unfortunately, but uh, <clears throat> um, it did have a, a big impact of the day. And uh, within their explanation of what was going on, uh, they talked about how they had underpredicted various physical phenomena. So the blockage effect that's gotten a lot of attention in the wind industry these last few years, 
and of course wakes. And maybe even more interesting is more interesting. this is likely an industry-wide issue. So this really motivates uh, someone like uh, or, or an institution like NREL and uh, the U.S. government to get involved to uh, to help improve uh, predictions of, of wakes and and things like blockage for the entire industry. So fast forward to uh, about five years later, uh, we still we see that uh, wake predictions have gotten better. Um, but they are still an issue. So this is a slide uh, that I borrowed from Orsted. <clears throat> um, and it shows a lot of different industry models that have been used in this uh, uh, wake model benchmarking exercise that Orsted is running. It's called Wake Tester. And I, I believe they, they run this test every year. They have a they have uh, SCADA data coming from it's either 18 or 19 different wind farms. Uh, for 48 different cases, and they look at the ability to predict the overall wake losses in all of these um, in all of these cases for uh, this wide range of models. So, um, as with back in 2019, you can see that again models continue to um, over predict. Um, the amount of energy produ produced, or or maybe underpredict the uh, the amount of wake loss. Uh, the bias here is, is still positive for all the models, and the uncertainty is uh, is still fairly high. So you can see for some of these cases in the benchmark, you're getting um, you know forty percent error for a, a particular case. And again, this is forty percent of maybe a ten percent energy loss. So it's really uh, for this particular case here, four percent of the overall energy capture, which is which is significant, and of course these are all kind of the most widely used and, and accurate models uh, available today. So uh, it continues to be important to study wakes and and get observations to be able to validate and improve these models. Okay, so in addition to wakes, we also have other environmental, um, well, wind farm atmosphere interactions that we're interested in. So we have wakes both at the turbine scale and also the wind farm scale, the larger scale. Um, but then other, th we're also interested, especially in awaken and, and other effects. So blockage that was mentioned in the Orsted press release. We want to know how the wind farm is exchanging momentum with the atmosphere. So what is the momentum flux between the atmosphere, both um, above and, and to the sides of the wind farm, and how does how are wakes replenished from mm -hmm. that momentum flux? We have large scale intermittent uh, turbulent events, um, so things like um, well even uh, gravity waves, Kelvin Helmholtz waves, um, atmospheric bores. I'll show an example of that later, actually. Um, Within the wind farm, we're interested in, in what the turbulence looks like. So how does the turbulence uh, uh, change as you uh, move through the wind farm and how does that impact the response of turbines and the reliability and structural loads? Then a couple other things uh, in the Awaken project, we're interested in how can we operate the wind farm differently so that we can minimize wake losses and also um, reduce the impact on turbines. So that's using wind farm control and that's a big part of the um, experiment going on now. And then also uh, uh, we do have some observations about the environmental impact, um, things like looking at the impact of, of wind farms on uh, on, uh, on rain uh, within, the, within the wind farm. So we have some distrometers deployed, uh, different temperature sensors, uh, things like that. Although I won't have too much information to show about that in this presentation. Okay, so a little bit of the history of Awaken. We actually had our first meeting back in 2018, and some of you were involved in kind of scoping out what the Awaken project would look like at the time. Um, <clears throat> and so with, with an overall goal of, of getting observations uh, in, in a large-scale field campaign, 
Yeah, somewhere in the United States. We did narrow that down into the southern Great Plains of the United States, and I'll explain why in a little bit. But the first uh, couple years uh, of the experiment were just a lot of planning agreements. Um, we have three different wind farm owners in the project, so getting um, data sharing agreements hammered out and, and lots of different um, maybe logistical activities to begin with, in addition to the design of the experiment. The experiment itself started in September of 2022 um, and has actually been running um, ever since. So um, uh, different instruments have come in and out of the experiment along the way, um, but we have a, a fairly consistent data set dating back to then and all of the SCADA data from all of these operating turbines. More recently, actually, uh, in May of this year, we have started our wind farm controls experiment, and that will continue until next year. Uh, looking uh, into well, in, into the next year, and actually the, the last year or so, we've really focused on data analysis and also model validation. So there's currently an ongoing um, international benchmark on wind farm wakes, which I'll talk a little bit later um, as well. Okay, so we have a, a pretty big team here, a substantial team. Um, this is a, a Department of Energy, Wind Energy Technologies Office funded program. So it's led by four national laboratories with NREL being the lead lab. The project of course would not be possible with our, without our industry partners. Um, so I mentioned the three wind farm owners. Um, Across all the wind farms in Awaken, we're lucky uh, that all of the wind farms only have a single turbine, and those are General Electric or GE turbines. Um, so that's made at least uh, data sharing agreements a little bit uh, more simple. We have a lot of university participants. Um, so especially, as you might guess, in the United States, uh, quite a bit, quite a number. But then also, um, I've uh, been fortunate to have some uh, uh, European and uh, partners um, and also uh, a good collaboration here with the University of Sao Paulo in Brazil. And then in addition to universities, uh, other parts of the, of the US government. So the ARM program is actually a, a different wing of the Department of Energy, but they have provided a lot of instrumentation out in the field. Um, and then similarly, NOAA, and there's Severe Storms Lab has uh, provided some instruments as well. Okay, so I, I explained um, kind of the wind farm atmosphere interactions that we're interested in. One of the first steps of this group that was shown in the last slide was to prioritize what are the most important uh, physical phenomena that we're interested in. And so here's that same list of things I showed on the previous slide, but prioritize. So as we're moving through through the Awaken projects, we are uh, really focused in, in going down this list of, of uh, priority. And uh, so our one of our first things, as I just mentioned, is this international benchmark on wind farm wakes, um, especially in the coming year or so. We'll focus a lot on smaller scale things like uh, turbulence within the wind farm and how does that impact loads. And then we actually have other activities going in all of these other areas, um, uh, but maybe just on a, a, a slightly uh, lower level of, uh, uh, of research. So those are, are all the, the priorities there. So uh, we picked a location back way back in, I think 2020 probably. Um, and that's in northern Oklahoma, so southern Great Plains. This is a, uh, a big area for wind production in the United States. The, the, uh, the red rectangle here actually represents the entire domain of the Awaken project. So it's a pretty large domain. It's about an hour and a half north of Oklahoma City. And here's a, a closer look. And, and within this domain, you can see uh, we have five different wind farms um, from those three wind farm owners. The biggest city is over here, Enid, Oklahoma. <clears throat> um, 
And then you also see uh, some purple rectangles here, or I guess those are diamonds. Um, and what those represent are ARM um, instrumentation sites. So as I mentioned, the ARM program contributed, contributed a lot of instrumentation to this project. And one of the reasons that we chose this location was the actual pre-existence of observations in the area even before the wind farms were built. So a lot of these sites, which are owned and operated by the ARM program, um, were first uh, developed back in 1992. Um, so there's a long record of observations in this area. Uh, the first wind farm that was built here was actually the Chisholm View wind farm, the one on the left, and that wasn't built until 2012. Um, so there's <clears throat> roughly uh, 20 years of uh, observations before any wind farms were built. And then uh, the most recent wind farm here is King Plains. And that was uh, first became operational in 2022. So actually right at the, <clears throat> excuse me, right at the beginning of, of the Awaken project. <clears throat> so uh, we have all the ARM sites, but then we also decided that we needed to create um, more uh, instrumentation sites. And so we ended up developing 13 of our own sites with different instruments. Although, let's see, E36 down here on the bottom, that's actually an existing ARM site. <clears throat> um, but you can see we're really focused on the southernmost wind farms from the previous graphics, so the, the three wind farms to the south. And uh, one of the major reasons for this is the predominant wind directions are from the south. So we really would like to see how are the winds changing and evolving as they're moving through the wind farm. And so having both undisturbed inflow and then observations through diff through the different wind farms um, are, are the reason that we put a lot of our instrumentation um, through the south and, and within the, the southern wind farms. The majority of instruments you, you see here are on the right in the King Blings wind farm, which is the newest wind farm. Um, and that one was actually chosen because the turbines are the the, uh, the most uh, recent. They have the, the newest technology and also uh, the newest control systems, which was um, important in particular for, um, for being able to do wind farm control within this experiment. The stars here represent uh, sites that are on the, the ground. Um, so kind of uh, different sites here in and around Armadillo Flats. Site B is undisturbed for the entire domain. We have the Texas Tech radars over here on the west. Um, some sites in between the different wind farms. So we want to measure how the how the different wind farms are interacting. Um, and then these uh, uh, north south transects really through the Armadillo Flats, or sorry, through the King Plains wind farm. And again looking at the evolution of, of the winds as they, they propagate through King Plains. The circles here represent instrumentation that is actually located on top of turbines or, or within turbines. So we have structural loading measurements on some of these turbines, but then also uh, nacelle mounted lidars to be able to measure uh, things like wakes and, and inflows on individual turbines. And we have a lot of instruments out in the field. So across these 13 sites and on top of those five turbines, we have over 50 different instruments. Um, and here's a snapshot of, of all of those. Um, so lots of different types of LIDARs, profiling, scanning LIDARs. We have thermodynamic profilers. So um, different ways to measure uh, temperature uh, using remote sensing. Texas Tech radars. Uh, we had quite a number of um, radio salon launches, uh, surface flux stations, and MET stations. And then maybe some of the more unique instruments. So NOAA had their Puma system, which is a, a truck-mounted LiDAR that was able to drive around uh, and actively take measurements uh, within the awakened domain for about a month last year. Um, or also around that same time, we had the University of Braunschweig aircrafts, which um, has taken wind farm wake measurements in the North Sea, but then uh, did a very similar campaign here for Awaken back in uh, September of last year again. 
starting next month that we're going to be deploying tether songs and, and really this is to get high frequency measurements within uh, the wind farm to look at the the turbulence in, in particular so uh, we have sonic anemometers installed along the the tether of this uh, of two different tether zones so that should provide some really inter interesting information and then lastly the clamp systems uh, from NOAA and uh, University of Oklahoma and really that's kind of a combination of, of um, thermodynamic profilers and, and LIDARs um, as well. Uh, we do have SCADA data from all of the individual turbines. That's uh, a little less than 560 wind turbines. This represents about 1.2 gigawatts of energy production. So really just the SCADA data itself is, is quite a data set um, to, to analyze. <laughs> And then we do have three highly instrumented turbines. So we have five turbines that have instruments on them, including uh, LIDAR is on top of them. But then also three of those turbines <clears throat> have additional instruments on uh, the structure. Um, so a lot of strain gauges, basically, both on the tower um, and uh, the blades and uh, things like the main shaft and, and uh, sensors around gearboxes and, and different encoders. Um, so these are in the King Plains wind farm, uh, these three turbines. And really, uh, the purpose there is to look at the uh, <clears throat> response of the turbine, how is uh, the turbulence changing throughout the wind farm, and then what is um, what is happening to these three individual turbines as things like wakes and, and other atmospheric phenomena are, are changing and, and impacting the turbines. <clears throat> And then we also have our wind farm controls test. So again, this is in the King Plains wind farm, uh, which is outlined here. And we have different sectors of the King Plains wind farm doing different types of control. So we have two different kinds of, of wind farm control that we're focused on for the Awaken project. One is consensus control, <clears throat> which is really... Um, an improved method for estimating the wind direction um, using a consensus method. So instead of each individual turbine estimating what the wind direction is um, at, at their particular site, it relies on its neighbors to come up with a, a consensus or kind of a weighted average to determine the wind direction. And this has been shown to actually um, improve improve the accuracy um, and the very and decrease the variability of of the uh, wind direction observation that's used to feed in the control system and then also the second uh, form of wind farm control is wake steering and so this is really just um, uh, yawing turbines that are upwind of other individual turbines such that the wakes from those individual turbines are turned away from the downstream turbines. The primary location for uh, wake steering uh, plus consensus is, is this box here of uh, 12 individual turbines. But the spacing is actually quite large in between the turbines, so it's, it's a well-designed wind farm to, to minimize wakes. Um, so we figured out that there wouldn't be a, a huge benefit to, to using wind farm control um in in kind of the when winds come from the southern direction so we did add a, a few additional pairs here you can see in the circles and those are chosen to test wind farm control where the spacing is a little bit closer um, particularly <clears throat> when the winds are from the southeast and we did some simulations of what the benefit of wind farm control would be um and and here we're using uh the nrel flores tool <clears throat> And you can see three plots here. So this is just wind direction. The top plot is, is just the wake loss. Um, and then the middle plot here is the percentage energy gain that we could get if we did wake steering within that, uh, within these 12 turbines in the box here. And then the bottom plot is just the absolute energy gain. Um, so as I mentioned, the spacing is quite large between the different rows. You're not getting much percentage gain when the winds are blowing um, between those rows, so kind of the southerly direction or from the north. 
but you do get some significant benefits here uh, when the winds are from the east or the west. And that's what that's what these two bumps are here. <clears throat> um, we did average uh, these gains over the entire wind rows for the year, and then depending on the turbulence intensity, which of course changes um, all the time, um, you get anywhere between kind of 0.06 uh, percent energy gain all the way up to, say, in stable conditions, maybe a, a quarter of a percent of energy gain. So um, not a huge uh, gain for this uh, for this particular wind farm, uh, but still of, of great research interest. And we should be able to tease out those gains and, and have been able to um, over the last couple months. Let's see, now I'll, I'll just kind of jump into some observations that we've seen, um, maybe going from small scale to larger scale. The first one here is um, how is the turbulence impacted? Um, so here's a great plot of a comparison of a sonic anemometer uh, placed at site A5. Uh, versus a sonic anemometer placed at site G, which is in the middle of the wind farm. So A5, especially when the winds are from the south, is really an unwaked, undisturbed observation. Whereas G, again, especially if it's coming from the south, or actually most directions, is going to be disturbed. And, and uh, if we focus on maybe the, the southerly flows again, that's the red box in this plot here, and uh, we break things down in uh, in terms of stability, so stable versus unstable conditions. You can see that um, during unstable conditions, maybe de uh, daytime atmospheric boundary layer, there isn't a big change between the two sites. So the, the atmospheric stability is, is really swamping um, any change from the presence of the wind farm itself. Whereas under stable conditions, there is uh, a big impact, and so uh, an increase on the order of something like 50% uh, higher turbulence intensity within the wind farm under stable conditions versus um, versus outside or undisturbed of the wind farm. So that's, um, of course, what we expected, that the wind farms are producing more turbulence, and the, the effect is really pronounced uh, within uh, say a stable atmosphere where the turbulence is already pretty low, or the, the background turbulence. We have uh, nacelle mounted lidars. So here's a, a photo of one of those lidars in the King Plains wind farm. And actually, uh, you can see the distrometer also located on the back here. Um, but some really interesting observations of individual turbine wakes. So here's a, a, a uh, contour of the wake shape, uh, eight diameters behind this particular wind turbine. Um, and uh, the top here is the mean velocity, and the bottom is the turbulence intensity. So as expected, we have a wake with lower mean wind speed and increased turbulence. What's maybe even more interesting is this is during stable atmospheric conditions with a lot of uh, wind veer. And so instead of a nice round shape of uh, the wake, you get this smearing of the wake shape. Uh, due to the veer. So it's kind of elongated, which is something that we've seen in, in simulations. Um, and um, so it's it's great to see that, yes, this actually happens um, out in the atmosphere in stable conditions. Then moving up a scale, uh, these are some observations uh, by the folks at uh, UT Dallas. And they have a LIDAR that's located in between the Armadillo Flats and King Plains Wind Farm here. And um, for this particular observation, the winds are coming from the northeast and the turbines are these uh, dots located here. You can see the individual wakes in this contour plot. And then if we take slices across each of these, um, each of these uh, wake sections coming downstream, you can get this nice line plot here. So you see the wakes um, are really, um, you can see the wakes of individual turbines, especially when you're not that far downstream. 
Um, but then the wakes begin to smear together and coalesce. And if we were to, to go even further downstream, this would become, of course, a wind farm wake. So thinking about the wind farm wake between the King Plains wind farm and the Armadillo Flats wind farm, this gives us an idea of the evolution of wakes and, and how they become wind farm wakes. We also have some uh, really uh, interesting observations from the Texas Tech radars. So as I mentioned, these radars are placed on the Western side of their domain. So we have two different radar systems and uh, you can operate them in dual Doppler mode. So each individual radar actually has its um, has a range of, of over 30 kilometers. So it's, it's a, a pretty powerful um, observation technique. But then when operated in a dual Doppler mode, um, you get observations in uh, these smaller circles, uh, which still covers a lot of the, um, the awakened domain. So these were primarily placed here to look at wind farm interactions between these three wind farms. So King Plains, Breckenridge, and Armadillo Flats. And here's some observations. Um, from those radars. And this one in particular emphasizes uh, individual turbine and wind farm wakes. What you can't see in the domain is actually the wind farm up here to the Northeast. That's the Thunder Ranch wind farm, but you can see some indication of the wake coming off of that wind farm. This wind farm here, all these little black dots, of course, are the turbines of the King Plains wind farm. And you can see the blue streaks of individual turbines here. And, um, and all of those wakes impacting uh, the Armadillo Flats wind farm. So um, <clears throat> just a, an amazing tool to be able to visualize lots of different physical phenomena um, going on across a, a large set of scales. We can also see other different phenomena. Um, so on the left here, we have a little bit closer look at um, the gap between Armadillo Flats and Breckenridge. And at the beginning of the, of the video there, um, you saw some gravity waves. So this is just, and there they are. Uh, this is just in front of, um, I believe it was a, a thunderstorm outflow or some kind of frontal passage where you can see the wind speeds are, are, are very high behind that um, frontal passage, but then, um, just in front of that um, passage is it creates these these gravity waves, which um, will likely have um, a big impact on the on the energy or the power production of individual turbines. And I'll actually show you a simulation of a similar case in a little bit. On the right here is just a, a still graphic of uh, it's not the same frontal passages, but a frontal passage. And you can just see the uh, the big discontinuity between uh, practically no winds um, uh, ahead of that frontal passage versus um, winds that are extremely high, actually even greater than 25 meters a second or, or past the operating um, condition of the wind farm. So a, a huge uh, ramp event passing through and, and you can really clearly see the um, uh, the front there, <laughs> which is great. And actually, Eliza Abraham here at, at, um, at NREL has developed a, a technique to identify these these uh, frontal passages and, and how they uh, move in time, which is uh, pretty, pretty interesting stuff. We've also been fortunate to record some extreme events. Um, so back in May, uh, the evening of May, there was a tornado um, that passed through the awakened domain. And what's interesting is there was actually an observer on the ground. Um, so we can, uh, you can see this video from the, the local weather station here <clears throat> and a snapshot. The weatherman here is pointing to a wind turbine that wind turbine is this uh, turbine here, just to the south side of the uh, radar observation domain. And you can see, if you, if you look at the contours here, it's, it's interesting. Um, you get both uh, highly negative and highly positive wind speeds. So this is meters per second um, 
so 30 plus. And um, what's interesting is, is you're actually getting some, some uh, uh, Nyquist uh, folding of the, of the signal. And so these wind speeds here are not uh, negative 30 um, uh, meters per second, but rather just they're above the current range of, of the analysis used to analyze the, um, the radar data. So um, talking to Brian Hurth at Texas Tech, he says that these wind speeds actually represent greater than 45 meters a second. Um, which is uh, over 100 miles an hour. So just a, a really significant uh, amount of wind happening here, propagating through the wind farm. See this doublet here of high versus low wind speed? That's the actual tornado that was captured. So passing right by this wind turbine here, it actually then propagated upstream uh, to the uh, north, northeast, or maybe east, northeast. Uh, we're only beginning to, to look at this. We actually have a, a, a separate project that Elisa Abraham will be leading, looking at different extreme events that have been um, observed in the awakened domain. There's a, there was also, even more recently, an interesting microburst in the same area um, uh, that has similar um, high wind speeds in the domain. No wind turbines were actually harmed in this uh, <laughs> by this tornado that we know of. Um, but still interesting to actually observe a, a tornado in an operational wind farm. <clears throat> okay, so then we'll go maybe a little bit uh, larger scale, looking at momentum flux. So this is some work done by Regu Krishnamurthy and his colleagues at uh, Pacific Northwest National Lab. And they're using uh, LIDARs here, uh, upwind and downwind of the King Plains wind farm to examine the momentum flux and the impact on mean wind speeds. And so if you look at the charts here on the right-hand side, you can see that upwind, uh, the, the, um, the momentum flux follows a fairly typical uh, profile through the atmosphere, but then is, is greatly um, increased. So here, the magnitude, even though it's becoming more negative, is increasing. Um, so indicating much greater momentum transfer between um, the atmosphere just above the wind farm and the wind farm itself. So that is a direct observation of this momentum exchange between the wind farm and the, and the atmosphere, which is, is great to observe and, and what we expect. Um, and then its impacts on the overall um, wind profile, again, you can see that momentum being extracted and lowering the wind speed um, above and within the wind farm itself. So all things that um, we expect to see and um, now have actual observations of that phenomenon. Continuing on uh, this analysis, this is this uh, momentum exchange, of course, is more pronounced. Uh, in the stable atmosphere, as a lot of our physical phenomena. <laughs> um, so luckily, well, we have a lot of stable conditions within in the awakened domain. Um, so most nights, the atmosphere is fairly stable. And again, you see this pronounced change from the wind farm as far as uh, momentum exchange. Whereas in the other profiles, in the neutral and unstable case, um, there is some impact, but not as quite as pronounced. Um, and I should mention that in unstable conditions, uh, there's also the traditional convective uh, change in momentum that may be influencing these some of these results. So it's a little bit difficult to parse out what is the impact of the wind farm versus what is just um, standard atmospheric mixing. And then uh, another interesting observation is the impact of low level jets. So um, this is actually all recorded in a paper, which you can go uh, download right now at uh, Wind Energy Science Discussions. So it's, I think the review actually just closed. So hopefully it will be published as a full paper fairly soon. Um, but thinking about how does the wind farm actually impact the low level jet, 
Um, and how does the um, height of the low level jet impact the momentum exchange? So um, one conclusion was that the wind farm itself actually changes the height of the low level jet. So you can see that in particular here, um, when the low level jet is low and close to the wind farm, that's the lines here uh, in the main wind speed on the left, you can see that the nose um, uh, upwind of the wind farm is, is somewhere less than 300 meters, whereas after the wind farm, of course, the, the nose of the jet is, is uh, raised. Um, so that's, that's changing the overall jet um, behavior in itself. Whereas uh, maybe the impact isn't quite as big if the uh, the jet is is already above the wind farm when it when it enters, and th that's the lines on the right here. What's maybe even more interesting is the momentum exchange is also influenced by the height of the jet. And so, if you compare if you compare the blue with the X's to just the blot the dotted blue line, those are both downwind profiles, one with a low jet and one with a higher jet. The one where the jet is higher or the jet nose is higher has much more momentum exchange than where the jet is lower and actually interacting more with the wind farm. So um, that in, in itself is a pretty interesting observation on, on how the momentum exchange uh, is going to change with uh, the uh, behavior of the low level jet. We've also done uh, a, or the team has done a good amount of work looking at how does the wind farm change the height of the atmospheric boundary layer. Um, so Aliza Abraham here at NREL is working along with uh, uh, folks at um, Lawrence Livermore, uh, Matteo uh, Buccioni. And what they showed is, again, uh, a, a big impact under stable atmospheric conditions. So nighttime boundary layer. <clears throat> um, the absolute value of the change of the boundary layer height is not that great, but the, the boundary layer heights are really low at night. Um, but there is a big uh, change. So up to 50% increase in the boundary layer height uh, in the nighttime boundary layer, just due to the presence of the, the wind farm itself. So here we're looking at difference between site B and site C1 uh, for winds coming from the south and southwest. So that's Pretty interesting. Not not a huge uh, change during the day during stable atmospheric conditions, as you might expect. Let's see. Here is um, some. Let's see if I can get this movie to start. Hmm. I cannot. Um, oh, there it goes. Um, all right. So this is some work done by Adam Wise um, now at Lawrence uh, Livermore. Uh, National Lab. He was at Berkeley when he did these simulations. So this is Worf LES, and he's actually trying to reproduce a gravity wave situation that um, happened from an atmospheric war um, occurring to the southeast of the King Plains wind farm. Let me try that again. Oh. Uh -oh. <laughs> okay, sorry to restart. Um, and so, uh, what that video showed was, um, get this restarted again. Well, we, um, we, could, we could see the video, it was running. Yeah. Okay. But then my thing crashed, so. Okay. Let me reshare. So what that showed really is, is the passage of this gravity wave through the wind farm. You can see the the impacts on uh, twelve of these turbines as far as power. So you can see the the changing power from the gravity wave. The the plot on the right here is the vertical wind speed at one kilometer height. Whereas the plot on the left here is the mean wind speed um, at hub height. So um, the impact on the mean wind speed is not huge um, or not, not too obvious from the, the movie on the right. 
Um, but if you isolate the vertical velocity, you, you can really see that gravity wave. Um, and it's also easier to see some of the fluctuations in the um, in the power from that. And I should say, this is all simulation, but um, Adam is, is working on comparing this um, to actual observations. If we look at the line plots from that event, um, you'll see that um, before the event, uh, you have kind of all of the different rows of the turbines operating at a similar level. So these are just four different rows of those 12 turbines highlighted. But then when the gravities come through, the gravity waves come through, there's a huge oscillation <clears throat> of um, the different rows. The front row is actually most impacted, um, followed by the third row actually has the highest energy production. And then um, the second row and the fourth row have the lowest energy production. So that's pretty interesting that the third row is, is higher than the, say, the second or the fourth row. And then after that event, uh, the power is, is decreased. So there's uh, lots of stuff going on, wind direction changes uh, during that gravity wave passage and, um, and different oscillations. Um, and again, uh, working to uh, validate this behavior in the actual observations, but this is what the, the simulation shows. So that's pretty interesting. And then we have other simulations. So this is just kind of a, a fun um, eye candy of a simulation done by Sandia National Labs of all of the wind farms in the domain. Um, this was a, a huge simulation run on uh, Oak Ridge's uh, big computer. At the time, it was the fourth largest computer in the world. You can see that this is a large eddy simulation. So we're resolving all of the individual turbines, all 558 turbines. Um, there's actually so much data in this simulation that we're not able to save all of the, the volumes, but we have, you can see these X's behind each individual turbine. Lots of detail on individual wakes. Each of these is also an open fast simulation. So we have loads and uh, and uh, control systems operating, things like that. There's a little house to scale. So big turbines, lots of information. Of course, one of the goals is to eventually um, compare this to observations and, and validate these types of models. Um, at lower fidelity, we have our floor simulation tool. And this was some interesting work done by Ryan Scott. Um, to be published in the Journal of Renewable and Sustainable Energy. What's great about simulations is that you can um, remove different physical phenomena. So this particular plot is isolating just the external wake uh, interactions between wind farms. So in other words, um, the differences in energy production are only impacted by wakes from other wind farms. So we've removed the wakes from uh, turbines within its own wind farm, and then just showing how other wind farms are impacting uh, turbines within uh, neighboring wind farms. And as you might expect, uh, what this is showing is um, the the the, uh, the wind turbines here in King Plains and Armadillo Flats, which are closest to each other, are the turbines that are most impacted by other wind farms as far as their energy production. So. Um, again, it's a fairly intuitive result, but to be able to able to quantify that with a, a, a simulation tool is, is interesting. Okay, so we have all these observations and what are we doing with it? Uh, one of the big things we're doing is developing benchmarks. So we want to release much of this data um, out to the international community to help everyone improve their models um, and benefit the whole industry. So last year we started the uh, a new IEA International Energy Agency task task 57 or JAM, um, and you can learn all about it here on this link and or that QR code will also take you to the JAM site and there's uh, presentations and, and meeting notes from all of those. Within JAM we have our uh, wind farm wake benchmark which has already started and is. Um, uh, in phase one currently. And what we're focused on, let's see, I already did these. Okay. Um, and what we're focused on here is a particular day um, in August. And we're looking at the interaction between two wind farms 
<clears throat> um, Armadillo Flats and uh, the King Plains Wind Farm. This day was chosen because of uh, mostly canonical conditions here. Winds coming from the south, southwest. You can see the presence of the low level jets here at night. Um, that's the, the yellow area here. Um, and then kind of a lot of daytime mixing. Um, and so just a pretty typical um, canonical diurnal cycle. And so having different models then compared to all the different observations of that are available for this, in addition to uh, SCADA data as well. <clears throat> um, so in this uh, particular wind direction, you can imagine that this far, part of the wind, King Plains wind farm is waked by armadillo flats, whereas on the eastern side of the King Plains wind farm, there is no wake. So there's a lot of variability uh, between the energy production based on those wake interactions. And um, maybe this is more of an invitation to anyone who's interested, uh, but there is still time to join. We have had some initial um, submissions for phase one. Phase one is really uh, trying to predict uh, the inflow and the energy production of those different wind farms. Um, and uh, we didn't have results available to present for this particular uh, presentation, but by the end of this month, Nicola is actually uh, presenting at the American Clean Power Conference and already seen some really interesting um, differences between different types of models. So uh, WARF uh, versus LES simulations. And um, I think it was something like uh, plus or minus 100% or 80% uh, difference between the two, two models. Um, so just a lot of variability. And uh, this benchmark will try to dig much deeper into what's going on and, and why are there such big differences between those models. Um, so yes, please join. Uh, you can read all about it here on this read, read, the, read the docs page and um, we'll hear much more about this in the coming year as this benchmark evolves, which is, is really exciting actually. <laughs> um, maybe just a plug for upcoming publications. So if you wanna read more about the experiment, we have a special issue of the Journal of Renewable and Sustainable Energy. Um, and many of these will be published by the end of the year. Uh, NOAA, the upcoming conference in the United States, will have lots of presentations, uh, as well as at AGU and the ACP conference, as I mentioned before. Uh, I actually think this is my last slide. So much of the data, uh, some of the data is proprietary, uh, such as SCADA and uh, the loads data, but much of, especially the atmospheric observations, are available from the WIND, the DOE WIND Data Hub. Here's a link here. As of yesterday, we had about 86 terabytes of data. Um, so just a, a massive amount of, of data to get through over 200 different channels, uh, 208 to be precise, of, of different observations. And, and one of the big goals actually for the next year is to, um, uh, to have maybe an outline of where are the interesting cases um, so that people aren't so overwhelmed um, who haven't been working with this data to be able to identify you know specific cases or interests that, that people might be interested in um, so that you have some guidance uh, as far as diving into the, the data set. So um, look for that in the, in the next year as far as documentation and kind of an event log, if you will. Actually, this is my last slide. So what's next? We have wind farm control studies ongoing. Uh, those will continue until next summer. Uh, tether sound deployment, so getting those high frequency turbulence within the wind farm um, coming up here next month. Uh, and then uh, we will actually start a follow-on project here in the fall. Um, it's called Endura, um, which is a, a clever uh, mashup of two different projects. The RAW project is a, a similar sister project focused on a single turbine. The Awaken project is larger scale. Um, we um, have every indication that that will run through 2027, really focused on data analysis and documentation. So to be able to uh, provide a, a data set that's usable and understandable by all. Many more benchmarks coming. 
um, in order of priority. So wind farm wakes being first, turbulence and loads probably next. And then we also have a, a another project um, on extreme events. So uh, for example, the tornado or that microburst that I, I mentioned in the past. Um, so yes, that's the end. And uh, just uh, leave in a few minutes for questions. Thank you. Okay, thanks so much, Pat, um, for that wonderful presentation. Um, and really, uh, you know, we you have lots of lots of virtual applause here. We're willing to take questions. Sakanta. Hi, Pat. Uh, very nice presentation. Lots of materials. Enjoyed it. So I have two questions. Um, one, a specific one from one from your slides, uh, slide twenty five specifically. And um, you are showing um, the impacts of wind farms on the low level jet. And we would expect that as you've shown that the, with enhanced diffusion, the low level jet, jet height will increase. What I'm a little bit uh, surprised about the magnitude of the low level jet wind speed across the boundary layer is also increasing and in the wake of the, the the wind farm, which I wouldn't expect. So what's the explanation for that? I Means in the right hand side plot of yours, like going from let's say 300 to 1000 kilometer, the, it seems like the it's increasing in the wind speed. Oh, uh, that is a good question. Let's see, Regu, do you have any ideas? I see you're here. <laughs> I am here. <clears throat> Sorry, my voice is a little bit uh, grumpy. I don't but... <laughs> so, uh, uh, so the impacts of the wind farm are observed through the boundary layer, so kind of. So, I think that one of the things that you're looking at the inflow in the red is just the main profile of the wind speed, but the wind speed deficits are observed through the boundary layer. Is that oh, your question? It is, it's actually increasing, right? If I understood the correctly, the the red and blue on the right hand side, they are about uh, 17, 18 meter per seconds with the diffused uh, low level jet that has increased. The about the new low level jet height is 500 meter, but the above the PBL height, PBL height, if I'm looking at it, is about 400 meters based on the momentum flux. So above the PBL height, your wind speed is higher in the wake of the wind farms and compared to your inflow. So that's the question I'm asking. So if where the, the mouse is, that's the line is much mm -hmm. higher, like 10 meter per second at the inflow and you have about going all the way 15 or higher, 16, 17. Oh, sorry, I think there's an interpretation issue here. So there, these are two different cases and events. So, Kanta, uh, so I have conditionally sampled all the events that are observed when the low level jets are observed within the low, you know, below 250 meters, and then conditionally sampled all the data where the low level jets were observed between 250 and 500 meters. So, you're looking at two different events here. Uh, so, the yeah. one on the right plot, uh, when you're looking at the, the star mark uh, plots, that is all when the low-level jets are between 250 to 500 meters. I see. And the and the, the, the dotted line plot, actually all the wind, all the low-level jets below 250 meters. So just for looking at the difference between the two inflow and outflow, please just look at the red and the blue, rather than looking at the two lines in, instead. I'm sorry, Ed. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. I thought the, the impact is so huge that we are changing right. the wheeler height from 300 to 500, to my bad. Okay, yeah, thanks, yeah. So thanks for the explanation. That, yeah. You okay, uh, so the next question, uh, Pat, is kind of a generic one uh, because you, at the end of it, um, your presentation, you mentioned WARF versus LES, and you can see that uh, there is no results, but you verbally said that there are, uh, I think Nicola's uh, presentation will show about 100% difference in the, in the results. Um, just curious, are you guys also looking at um, just the, uh, impact of the PBL parameterization or alias subgrid scale models and uncertain, not the wake part itself, not the wake modeling influence. But if you, what I have seen in the last 20 years, if we change the, the PBL parameterization or alias subgrid scale for low level jets or stable boundary layer, 
the uncertainty is more than 100%. And so have we improved on that? And then is the wake uncertainty is more than the PBL part or just a small fraction of it? Yeah, another good question. I don't I don't believe, let's see, did we recommend a certain PBL scheme, Nicola? I can't remember. No, no, we don't recommend one. And we are actually receiving uh, submissions from modelers that have used different versions of the uh, PBL or um, the wind farm parameterization. And we're going to uh, compare all of this, all of these. Uh, we don't have results yet just because the, the submissions are coming in now, basically, the deadline was was last week, I believe. So once we have all the submissions, we will look into that. Also, within a given war setup, for example, we have submissions that use different uh, amounts of added TKE. And so we're going to compare all of those across different families of models and then some more in-depth analysis within each uh, family of model. But yeah, we don't have results yet. OK, thanks. I would be interested to find that result. Thank you, Nicola. And, Pat. and I will note that Julie typed in the chat um, that various folks are tweaking PBL schemes, and she's doing MYNN and 3D PBL. Thanks, Julie. Okay, so I think we are out of time. Uh, this has been a really good start to this year's uh, European American Seminar Series. Next month, um, we are back to our second Wednesday of the month at this time. And um, our speaker on October 9th is Julia Gottschalt talking about use of ship bait based LIDAR measurements to verify mesoscale model simulations, satellite data, other applications, et cetera. Um, you'll be getting a flyer on that before too long. And we have a great series set up for the rest of the year and looking forward to seeing all of you back for those. So thank you, everyone. See you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.